Kaminaga is a recent alumnus of Tolganis Hotel School and the founder and CEO of Practice Makes Perfect. Practice Makes Perfect is a nonprofit organization based in New York City that serves as an alternative to summer school and has a mission of narrowing the black and white gap by serving underprivileged students um, in districts by matching academically struggling elementary and middle school scholars with older, high achieving year care mentors from the same high needs community. While at Cornell, Kareem was a Hunter R. Rollins Presidential Research Scholar and a winner of Cornell's JFK Memorial Fellowship and Distinguished Leadership Award. Moreover, Kareem nationally is a Newman Civic Leadership Fellow, a Pearson Prize Fellow, and a Presidential Fellow from the Center for the Civil of the Presidency and Congress. Most recently, he was featured in Forbes Magazine in the 30 Under 30, um, in particular the senior section of related education. And there are many things I can say about Kareem accomplishments um, too many to, to list without going into his time as a speaker. And so what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to introduce Kareem and he will speak for about 40 minutes with plenty of time and questions at the end. So please give a warm return for now. Welcome to She was like, my son is going to be a Cornell lecturer and here I am with this like, high school education. So if someone in the back doesn't mind taking a photo, I would appreciate it so I can send it there after and prove there that I was here lecturing. Thank you. Gotcha. <laughs> so I've been back to campus maybe eight times in the last two years, so this doesn't feel that boring to me. I actually love coming back and speaking to students. Um, I'm actually going to kick it off by telling you guys two things that I've been grappling with more recently. And then I'll jump into my background, personal story, and then I'm going, make, I'm going to ask all of you all to make a commitment, a commitment to action. So the two things I'm grappling with are, the first one is that equal is inherently unequal. Equal is inherently unequal. So what do I mean when I say that? Um, I heard that you guys are starting to talk about like funding and, and education and public schools and systems like that. Um, well, it comes around this like mindset that there are so many inequalities that kids are sort of born with or born into that by making situations at face value equal, we're inherently treating them unequal. Um, and the example that I like to use is the funding example on our public school systems now. You have a suburban community and then you have an inner city or a rural community that's under-resourced. If you were to pay per pupil $10,000 in each of those districts, right, you have an equal amount of spending across both of those places, you are inherently putting the kids in the inner cities and in the rural neighborhoods at a disadvantage. Because they don't come from the same nuclear household where they have two parents. They probably don't have the same sort of living conditions. Um, and so by giving them the same amount, or we're inherently saying this is equal, right, because what we're giving our suburbs are more affluent neighborhoods, we're inherently creating an unequal situation. Um, I don't know if you guys know what per people spending is across the US. On average, it's about $15,000 per kid. Um, the cost of sending kids to private school is anywhere from $30,000 to $150,000 a year. Um, and we know when we send a kid to private school, there's about a 98, 99% chance they're going to graduate from college. When we send our kids to public schools, we're spending a third of or half of the lower tier of what a, a private education would cost. And then we ask ourselves, why don't we get the same outcomes? Or consistently get the same outcomes across all these different areas. So there's definitely an efficient spending that exists. But I think when we think about our per people spending, we're at a huge disadvantage or, or under resourced <coughs> in our public schools um, from the very beginning. That makes it really difficult to like move forward. So we can't now sit there and say we're going to give thirty thousand dollars to the inner cities or forty thousand dollars to our rural poor and only give ten thousand dollars to our suburban like kids or the affluent kids. You can't punish people for being born into a better situation. So it's hard to think through that issue, but I'd love to hear a solution or an idea for one um, as we get towards the end of this conversation. But just remember that um, equal is inherently equal. The second um, thought that I want to share today is this idea that um, every single outcome in some way, shape, or form is influenced by race. And you're probably thinking, like, this guy's crazy. Like, he came here and he's going to just talk about all this like, inequality that exists out there. Um, and the reality is that even though the initial like, decision may not be influenced by race, the final outcome is. And the example I like to use is, um, you have an African-American kid and you have a Caucasian kid. Both of them go into a deli or a 7-Eleven and let's say they shoplift. The store owner does what any store owner does, um, is supposed to do. He calls the police, both of them are taken into the local precinct. 
both kids come in at the same exact time, like they may have stolen gum or whatever it may have been, it's a slap on the wrist. For an African American kid, 70% of them grow up in single parent households, and only 9% are raised by single fathers, which means 60% of them are raised by single mothers. Or on the other side, I think it's about 70 or 80% of Caucasian kids are raised in two parent households, or both parents are involved in their lives. So at the precinct, the intake center, you know, ideally need a parent to come and pick you up because it wasn't a huge offense. You're not going to send a kid to jail for it. The African American kid's parent is working a second job or two jobs, has other siblings they take care of, um, and they don't show up. Caucasian kids' parents come in, and show up, they take the kid out 80 to 90 percent of the time, slap on the wrist, and it's done. Your African American kid now has been through the incarceration system. They're seeing a public like defendant and a judge, um, and then leave them with like a misdemeanor or a ticket at the end of the day. And what inherently was not based on race, right, they both went into the store and shoplifted, ultimately became a, or it became an outcome that was influenced by race, right? Because at the moment they got to the precinct, um, they sort of had different outcomes because of their familial situation or circumstances. So thinking through that, what do you do, right? Do you sit there and you say, because you're African American, your parents don't have to come and pick you up? Um, how do we continue to create or foster a system that's equal or, or just um, in, in equivalent or unequal like times? Right? Because to do anything more in that situation for one kid over the other makes it unfair. Right? Because we want to remain fair, but we also need to be equal. Um, so those are the two bigger issues I'm grappling with and thinking through. Um, and, and they have been on my mind a lot more recently because of the work that I do. Um, so, if you guys are thinking about things that you want to solve or think through, I'd be happy to have you guys as thought partners in those. Um, so by way of background, I was raised in Long Island City, Queens. Um, both of my parents were Egyptian immigrants. They came here because they wanted to start a family and provide them with a better life. So the traditional like immigrant story. Um, my father passed away when I was a lot younger. Um, so by virtue of growing up in a low-income neighborhood, my brothers and I went through some of New York City's most struggling public schools. Um, I also wasn't that engaged in school. I wasn't inspired by my teachers. I didn't see the connection between school and the real world. Um, I had 60 absences in seventh grade, and my school teacher just sort of turned a blind eye to it. Right? If you have 20 absences in the school, you're actually supposed to be held back. Um, and they sort of just said, no, keep on moving, like, let's get out of the system. I went to my local high school. My high school had a 55% graduation rate. 20% of the kids in my high school were graduating college ready. 10% probably matriculated and graduated from four-year schools. But I wasn't sitting there thinking about how broken our system was. When our teachers were absent, I wasn't sitting there crying and thinking about how we were being robbed of our education. My friends and I were celebrating, we were running up and down the hallways, we were having a blast, right? Like, the teacher's not here, the substitute teacher had a really hard time. You don't know that you're losing out on your education. Um, I was lucky, I got involved with a series of like nonprofits and mentors who stepped into my life and ultimately made a big difference for me. Um, one of the earlier ones was called Rewarding Achievement. They picked 31 of New York City's most struggling public high schools and they paid kids there to pass AP exams. There are 200 or 300 struggling high schools in New York City, so I lucked out. I was in one of the right schools and I was there at the right time. Um, and the big difference for me wasn't so much the support the nonprofit gave, but the relationship I built with this man named Eddie Rodriguez. Eddie Rodriguez was one of the executive directors of the program, successful Puerto Rican male, who I sort of could relate to. He had gone to Columbia and then went to NYU Law, had a successful like, legal career, and then ultimately he decided he wanted to do something to give back and started this nonprofit. And though he wasn't a mentor to me at the time, he was a positive role model. Right? He was someone who I said I wanted to be like, and that changed my perspective towards my own education. Um, I scored a 1770 out of 2400 on my SATs, and that was a uh, it's a sore topic here, especially when everyone's talking about a really elite university. Um, that put me in the 95th percentile in my high school, but in the 70th percentile nationwide. So when we look at SAT scores, when we look at these assessments, we don't compare them relative to the neighborhoods that kids grew up in. We look at them at a national scale and say that every single kid was given the same amount of resources and opportunities, when that, in fact, wasn't the case. Because had you looked in a more local context, you would have seen that I was naturally a higher achieving kid or someone who used resources a little bit more efficiently. I applied to two schools when I was getting ready to graduate from high school. MIT, because I saw on Google Hunting. Right? Have you guys have seen that movie? Robin Williams. Yeah. Hilarious, right? And then the other one was um, Baruch. It was a local business school. I knew I was going to be a rapper. I was going to be a basketball player, so I had to be a businessman. <laughs> so that was my thought process or logic there. I didn't get into MIT, and rightfully so. I didn't have the SAT scores at the time. 
Um, so I wound up going to Baruch. I got a 4.0 in my first semester. I reached out to Eddie Rodriguez, who was a role model for me at the time, and I was like, listen, um, what should I do? He encouraged me to transfer. Um, I realized in that moment that I had actually never met a college-age student until I got to college. It's the 21st century, we're living in America, and I never met a college-age student and built a relationship with a college-age student until I got to college. And that is still a huge like, problem that persists in some of these inner-city and low-income neighborhoods. And for you to, sometimes they say, like, seeing is believing. Right? Like, you need to see someone who's done something at like, one of these schools we can relate to, and it looks like you to make you feel like this is real, it's possible for you. It's an opportunity that you should take advantage of. Um, so I came up here to visit, um, and while I was up here, it was February, and they were like, if you love Cornell in February, you're love Cornell all year round. <laughs> and they were, they were right. It doesn't get any colder than that. Um, and then I hung out with a bunch of architecture students randomly, um, and we started talking about different schools or universities I could possibly transfer into. Um, at the time, I knew I wanted to study business. One kid said there would be applied economics and management program in the agricultural life sciences school. And I looked at him and I was like, I want to be a farmer, so <laughs> maybe not. And then now, now actually being on campus, sometimes that was a real business school on campus. And but one of the other kids was like, listen, um, there's a the hotel school, the kids there are pretty cool. And you grew up in the inner city and you're a kid, you want to be cool. So I was like, that's where I'm going to apply. And in my application, I um, was lucky enough to get it. It was one of the best experiences of my life being here and immersed with so, like, such like, great students and faculty, um, honestly. And in the process of transferring, this is where the impetus of Practice Space Perfect started. Um, I started applying for different scholarships. One of the scholarships I ran across was funded by the Danubio College Fund in Coca Cola. So McKinsey and Company had just done a report that they published in 2009 on the inequality and the achievement gap in America's like, schools. And they said that the achievement gap, or the disparity in academic achievement between low-income students and their more affluent peers was costing our economy between $300 billion and $500 billion each year. And that was the economic equivalent of a permanent national recession. So 2009 was the recession, so it's obviously fresh on everyone's mind. And they said, well, we have $10,000 to any student who comes up with a, with a solution for the achievement gap that involves corporate intervention. I remember thinking, like, I know nothing about the achievement gap, I know nothing about corporations work, but I was still on ten thousand dollars for Cornell, right? So, what do you do? What would you do in that situation? Who said that? Someone said something. Yeah, you learn about it. You don't start doing research. Yeah, you're not going to give up ten thousand dollars that easily, are you? So I started doing research, and up until that point in my life, I was a very rugged individualist. I always felt like the kids who work hard are the ones who are going to make it, and the ones who didn't are the ones who aren't. And I had my older brother as my prime example. He didn't wake up early to go to school. He didn't stay late to do his homework. When, he, when we graduated high school the same year, he dropped out of a two-year college. Like, it made perfect sense to me. And then I started learning about all these sociological influences. And I started to think back to uh, how did being raised by a single mother on government aid, or hanging out with the kids we hung out with, we didn't think education was important influence the way we thought about education for in our lives. The reality is that if you don't think something's important, you don't dedicate any time or put any attention towards it. And if you do, you're going through some serious cognitive dissonance. So we grew up in a neighborhood where the kids around us didn't think education was important. And it wasn't until we were 17 or 18 that we realized that education was important. Um, and I, I talk about this sometimes, but the reality is when you're growing up in a low-income neighborhood, you're a lot more short-sighted. Right? You're thinking about that next month, that next week, or that next day. You're not thinking about this like 20-year payout for your education that's going to come out one day. Um, and in the neighborhoods that we grow up in, the people around us also like come in and they ask us questions that are really different. Right? Like my entire middle school and high school career, people come into our classes and say, raise your hand if you're going to college. Or show of hands how many of you guys are going to college. And it wasn't until I got to Cornell and was telling one of my friends that experience that he looked at me and said, Kareem, I never got asked that question in my life. It was always, what college are you going to? And just that structural variation in the way the question is asked made it socially unacceptable for him to not have thought that college was an option for him. For us, for us as kids, it was always an option. And I know in the Hamptons and in, in Hollywood, the actors and the really rich movie stars aren't telling their kids that college is not an option for them when they're little kids. They're not saying, Johnny, it's okay, you can go to two-year college, it'll be all right. The, the goal is you're going to finish college and we're going to figure out what you're going to do after. Um, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be enforcing that or thinking that way for all of our students and kids. 
So I learned about all these like inequalities. I start to think about the sociological influences. I start taking Professor Haskins of Haas five years in advance, um, learning about the disparities that exist out there and foreseeing them. Um, and I get really, really upset. Because that was me. That was my siblings. That was my friends on the football team. And now I'm reading this stuff that's saying that we were written off. That like we were set up to fail. 11% of first generation college students don't finish college. 11%, oh, sorry, 11% finish college. So 11% of first generation um, students will finish college. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, no way, I'm not gonna be a statistic. Why am I a statistic? Why is everyone else a statistic? Um, and then I came up with this like premise and I felt like, why are we being judged because of our socioeconomic class or our race? Why are we being written off because of our socioeconomic class or our race? Why do we know about, why have we known about this for so many years and that nothing's changed? That like freaks me out, right? That, like we've sat, we've sat here for decades. The research isn't new. It's not new, right? The players in the space aren't new. Um, the information isn't new, and no one's doing anything about it. And what people are doing isn't doing anything. And that like really really upset me. So I didn't win the scholarship, uh, but as you can imagine, I didn't feel like the numbers were numbers. They weren't just numbers. They were real people. They were the people I grew up with, the people on my football team, my siblings in my household. Um, three weeks ago, I was having a conversation with my mom and my younger brother who goes to my high school now, who's a junior there. And I was trying to explain to my mom that in our public school system here, in your lower income neighborhoods, if a kid does everything he's supposed to do, and that's it, they're set up to fail. We built a public education system in our lower income neighborhoods that if a kid does everything they're supposed to do, and that's it, they're set up to fail. Why is it the norm that if a kid does everything they're supposed to do and that's it, that they succeed? Those are the questions we need to start grappling with. Those are the systems we need to start fixing. Right? I was lucky, I did more than what I was supposed to do. But that shouldn't be the norm, that's not the status quo. If a kid was average and they went through our public schools, they should be set up to succeed. It shouldn't be the other way around. So those problems are obviously really real. I still grapple with them day to day in the like, life that I live. Um, and I think because it was a lot more personal, I took a, a liking to the work that I was doing. Um, it meant a lot more to me. Um, by virtue of growing up poor, then you want to be rich. So I got involved in another mentoring program um, where I was paired up with a mentor who was an investment banker at Goldman Sachs. I was a former was a Rhodes Scholar, graduated from UPenn, was like, Kareem, you're hardworking, you're smart, um, you should go work on Wall Street. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Did my internships at Goldman Sachs and at BlackRock. I enjoyed what I was doing there. Um, I thought it was cool, but it wasn't ultimately what I thought I could do or what I could accomplish. Um, knowing what I do about all the problems that existed, it wasn't what motivated me every single morning. Um, so I got to a point where um, senior year, I had to decide whether or not I wanted to work on Practice Makes Perfect full time, um, and ultimately felt like there was an opportunity to do something bigger. So let me take a step back and tell you guys about how the organization started. So I did all this research my freshman year of college Transfer, get it to Cornell, really excited about it. Um, I dream of an idea of like a near peer mentoring program over the summer. And we focus on summer because the research on the achievement gap shows that there are a thousand different reasons for why the achievement gap exists. Poor health conditions, lack of positive role models, um, you name it, like it's, it's probably a contributing factor to the achievement gap. But they said that two thirds of it can be directly attributed to unequal summer learning opportunities. Kids in low-income neighborhoods over the summer forget anywhere from two and a half to three and a half months of their learning. Then they go back to school the following year. The teacher knows they forgot all this material, so they spend about a month and a half teaching them old content. In the math really quickly, three months here, three and a half months there, another month and a half, that's about five months. Who knows how long a school year is? Anyone? She's smiling, what is it? Nine, nine, ten months, right? And every single year you lose five months, that's almost half, if not more, of your education. Now the, those losses start to compound. And every single year you're a student, you're getting 100. And then maybe you guys did, but most kids are getting like 80 or 85% of the material they're supposed to learn. So if they're losing half of that, by the time they get to eighth grade, they have a fourth grade reading level. And then we sit here and we ask ourselves, why does this eighth grader have only a fourth grade reading level? Well, the reality is they've only been in school theoretically for half, of the, half the amount of time. And so that made sense to me. Now I know why this is two thirds of the achievement gap. How do we solve such a large part of the achievement gap? To me, the obvious solution was summer school. 
right? Like kids should just go to school over the summer, that's how they fix the problem. So there's a, the, the secret that everyone knows is that no one wants to go to summer school. No one. How many of you guys wanted to go to summer school? Not the enrichment stuff that you do, like not the college visits and stuff, like summer, summer school. No one, no one wants, I don't even want to go to summer school. Um, summer school sucks. The kids don't want to be there. We're stigmatizing it. We took all of the kids who were struggling and then we threw them in one class. And then we picked the oldest teacher who's been teaching for the longest, like the one who's been in the classroom most consecutive days, and we say, you go teach these kids. The kids who didn't learn what they were supposed to learn in 40 weeks are now going to magically learn it in 18 half days over the summer. With a teacher who doesn't care and kids who don't want to be there. Does that sound like it works? I don't know. It doesn't work. 60% attendance rates. Most of the kids who are going failed the exams again at the end of the summer. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with um, Chancellor Harold Levy. I mentioned his name because he's a Cornell alum. He was the chancellor of the New York City public school system from 2001 to 2003. Um, at that time, Mayor Giuliani actually stepped up and said, I want to end social promotion. Social promotion is the idea of like passing a kid just because they're 10 years old, so they should be in fifth grade, per se. Um, whether or not they were actually on grade level. And so the mayor said, yeah, every single kid who isn't on grade level, and the chancellor said, well, that's great, but did you know that only 60 or, did you know that 60 or 65% of our kids are on grade level? And he goes, I don't care, fail them. So the chancellor goes, well, I'm not going to fail every single kid. Research shows that if you fail a kid, they're 25% less likely to graduate. So if you fail them twice, and there's just a little bit of a compounding effect, those kids are now more likely to drop out than graduate. And we know that an 18-year-old high school dropout has a worse economic impact on our society than an 18-year-old with a fourth grade reading level. So he went and begged the Board of Regents, and they gave him $180 million. He ran the nation's largest summer school program. He put every single kid in summer school. He's like, Mayor, I got an even better idea for you. Instead of failing all of these kids, I'm going to put them in summer school. I'm going to make them so miserable so that they, don't, they work harder during the school year. The following year, they don't have to come back. And it didn't work. I don't know if that would work. That was, I don't know the logic. I guess hindsight is 2020, right? But in that moment, it didn't work, and it hasn't worked. And every single year since then, we've only cut back summer. Right? We've said kids don't want to be there. It's horrible. Let's not send anyone there altogether. This last summer, New York City sent only 6% of its kids to summer school. You know, 65% were not on grade level. So we had a letter to editor feature in the New York Times talking about how that isn't a legitimate excuse. Right? Everyone is really mad at the mayor, like, mayor, you're, you're going back to social promotion, and the mayor's standing there like, well, who the hell wants to go to summer school? Which isn't, like, it's cool, but that's not a valid reason to not redesign summer school. Um, so you can think of us as the new summer school. Um, Practice Makes Perfect now is a full-service summer school provider. So when we started out, we were running summer enrichment programs, right? We were trying to solve this problem of the summer learning loss. Um, and the only way to do that was to raise philanthropic dollars um, and get people to support our mission, support our organization, so we can support more kids over the summer. And then slowly realized that our schools loved what we were doing, but they didn't care that much about it. Right? What was another three months when your kids are two years, two and a half years behind grade level? But no one wants to run summer school, right? No one wants to run summer school. So we said, we'll run your summer school for you. And they were like, fine, and we'll pay you. So now we've been in the business of summer school operations. So we're starting to privatize summer school. We've modeled our branding off of Nike and Jordan and Gucci and Prada, the things that like resonate for kids and their like favorite role models on TV. And we do a lot of mindset shifting. So they'll pick the kids that they want in the summer school program. We'll come in, we'll put them in a classroom, we'll give them a cool swag bag. They get a cool folder, it says like practice makes perfect on it. And the letter it says congratulations, we're gonna roll in the practice makes perfect summer program. They get a cool t-shirt, and now they're excited. They're pumped to go like be in the summer school program. And it's in their schools, right? Schools are essentially unused real estate over the summer when kids aren't there. Um, we've also had huge like nutrition problems where our Department of Agriculture is funding these satellite programs in these low-income neighborhoods to keep kitchens open over the summer so kids have consistent meals. And the kids aren't going because they're ashamed to like walk through their neighborhoods and ask for a free meal. So when there's no programs, we're also adding to the obesity rates that are taking place over the summer and the malnutrition that happens to take place. So now we've come in, we've rebranded and redesigned summer school, we make it cool and exciting for kids to want to come out. Um, Congressman Akeem Jeffries, who sits on the Education Committee, came out last summer. He gave us a backhanded compliment, but we'll take it. 
He like looked at the kids, he saw how engaged they were in their polynomials, and he looked at the board, he said, like, 45 minutes for gym. And he was like, there's no way. This isn't the type of program that you traditionally think of as engaging inner city kids over the summer. Usually you think that it has to be all recreational um, in some sort or some fashion. Um, and that wasn't the case, and it wasn't the norm. So four and a half years ago now, four and a half years ago, um, came up with this like crazy idea, this like cool near peer model. Um, I started pitching people on it. I was like, listen, this is the idea for what I want to do. People would simply ask me how I was or how I was doing. And I, most people actually don't care when they ask that question. They wonder, unless they genuinely like know you in passing, like, oh, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, how are you? All right, cool, and then everyone just keeps moving, right? You guys get that, right? Yeah, you guys are not, you guys do that to other people too. I can't believe it, shame on you. <laughs> So I would like talk people's ears off for five minutes. I'd be like, I'm great, but you don't listen to this. And they're like, oh, I gotta go. <laughs> and then people started asking me how I was doing about it, like what was going on, what were my updates. Um, and I realized that after a couple of like, conversations, I wasn't making any progress. Um, and people were now asking me what I was doing about it. So I was starting to get a little embarrassed, right? Like here I was coming up with this idea and I haven't done anything with it. So I pulled a few friends aside and was like, hey, let's do this. I think it's a cool idea. I know you're interested because you kept asking me about it. Um, I found a friend who knew how to build a website. I put him on our co-founding team. I had five other co-founders here within Cornell. Um, and I was like, listen, if nothing else, everyone tells you that your education isn't so much about what you're learning in your classroom, but it's about the relationships you're going to build. And I was like, if this failed, uh, or if it didn't work out, we'd be building relationships amongst each other by working on this that would transcend our time here at Cornell. And today, those are still some of my closest friends. So we got together, we started applying for a bunch of like different business plan competitions, we put our idea on paper, we started sharing it with mentors and advisors. I reached out to Eddie again and was like, hey Eddie, can you like look over this? He was like, this is awesome, let me help you put together an advisory board. And so just by asking and sharing our idea, things started to naturally come together. Um, I started running triathlons to raise money for the organization our very first summer. I went to one every single summer now to continue to raise money and awareness for the work that we're doing. Um, in the last two years since I've graduated, we raised two and a half, we were more than $2 million, and then over half a million dollars in service-like sales from privatizing summer schools. We have a full-time team of 12 in New York City. We had about 60 people on payroll last summer, um, just operating summer school programs and giving jobs to these higher achieving mentors and college students. Um, so we take kids now who are academically struggling in grades K through eight. We pair them with higher achieving role models and mentors who are four years older. So literally, if it's a first grade class, the mentors are fifth graders. If it's a uh, seventh grade class, the mentors are 11th graders. If the mentors are 13 or older, they're getting a summer job. Everyone knows the summer youth employment program is one of the biggest waste of times. Um, now we're taking these um, youth who would have otherwise been in the summer youth employment program and giving them a job as a mentor to roll out to a kid in their neighborhood. And they can empathize with the adversity of the kids who are younger than them are facing because they live in those same neighborhoods. So we recruit the mentors from the local schools. So if it's an elementary school we're partnered with, we're recruiting from the local middle school. If it's the middle school, we're recruiting from the local high school. Then we have college students who lead the instruction. We've designed one of the first like national teacher internship pipelines. So we had about 500 college students apply last year for about 13 spots to teach in our classes. Um, we created a five-week like realistic job preview. The teaching profession is one of the few professions out there that didn't really have an internship. <coughs> Right? You can sign up to Teach for America, you can do grad school, maybe break the collaborative into a little bit of a sneak peek, but you're not getting a full classroom with kids who are really struggling. Um, so you have that opportunity now in our classrooms. Um, our mentors get a, get, get a summer job, our college students get $13 an hour, which is a living wage in New York City. And then for every two classes, we have a certified teacher, and the teacher acts as a coach for our college students. There's a lot of pressure today on to like teacher compensation to evaluation, but no one gives a teacher an evaluation to actually see what it looks like on the other side. So we would design a model where everyone is also structurally a beneficiary um, in the process. So everyone gets something out of the model itself, other than just like working. Um, and then we run a five-week academic intensive summer program for our students, um, make it fun and exciting for them. So that's what we're doing now. That's a little bit on the background of the work that we've been carrying out, and then. The other piece for me, really senior year, which I think a lot of you guys are going to grapple with, was the, how do I know this is the right thing for me? Right? So now I've started the organization, or how do I start a nonprofit, and going, building off of that, um, thinking about whether or not this is for you. Um, and I was talking to the group earlier today during lunch, and I always said that 
I didn't feel like my parents or played a large influence on what I was ultimately going to do, but I think I had pressure from the nonprofits I was a part of, right? Because they invested a lot in me, these scholarships that like helped pay my tuition, um, and they felt like success was getting a job after college. And so I thought through that, right? I had done my internships now on Wall Street. I had we had run our summer program for two summers. Um, I had a really lucrative like job offer at BlackRock my senior year, really early on because of my internship. And my mom didn't really know what either of the things were, so it didn't really matter. I was going to go back to her and say like, hey, what do you think of this? Um, and I went back to like my mentors for these nonprofits, and I was like, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Um, and I had a few falling outs, right, where people said that if I did this, I'd be crazy. Right, like no one in their right mind would do this right now. This is too ambitious. This is too difficult. Most people fail. Why don't you continue to do this on the side? Um, and you have a bunch of people who continue to doubt what you're able to do. Um, and it's funny because those same people, I would say like almost two weeks ago, are now calling me a child prodigy. So I'm sitting and I'm like, do you recognize that two and a half years ago you said I was crazy and now you're coming back and you're saying this is like genius or whatever? Um, so just realize that things are impossible until they're accomplished. Um, so don't forget that piece of it either, right? Like, think big, think ambitious, and think hard. But I sat there and I said, I love my mom. She obviously doesn't know like anything about what I'm doing or understand the college I went to. Um, and there are obviously a lot of like different social pressures associated with like leaving for college too. Um, and then I have these mentors who do understand what I'm giving up, who are like super invested in me and obviously have my best interests at heart, but don't really know what I'm doing either. Right? Like, it was something new, it was something unproven. Um, and it's something I wanted to take a chance on, and ultimately told myself that if in five or 10 years I went down this Wall Street route and I had a bunch of money and I looked at myself in the mirror and I was unhappy, no one was gonna step up and say, Kareem, I'm the reason why you're unhappy. Right, no one gets up and says, I'm the reason why you're unhappy today. Because that happiness comes from within. You need to own your decision. And so after dwelling on all this advice and talking to so many people, I ultimately sat there and was like, if in five or 10 years I stood up in front of the mirror and I had everything that I thought I wanted, but if I was unhappy, there would be no one there to blame but myself. Right? If I had regrets around these decisions, like there would be no one to blame it but myself. And so I had to do or, or make the decision in that moment that I felt wasn't going to cause me that level of anxiety later. Or if I was unhappy, I could at least feel the, I could feel the comfort in knowing that I made those decisions. Right? If, I was, if I was unsuccessful at what I was trying to do. So once I committed to making a decision, I started to think about whether or not it was the right decision. And I asked myself what I call these like purpose finder questions now. There are three simple questions. Right, why is this important? Why is this important to me? Why am I the right person to be doing this? And then I asked myself those same three questions again with the word now at the end of it. Why is this important now? Why is this important to me right now? And why am I the right person to be doing this right now? So I knew why it was important. I had been doing this research for three years now. Right? The achievement gap was huge. It had a negative impact on our economy. So many of our like, kids that I was growing up with were written off. Like, to me, that was super important. And it was important to me because it was the way I grew up. It was the way my siblings were growing up. It was the neighborhood that I grew up in. And then why am I the right person to be doing this? And this one took a little bit more like introspection and a little bit more digging. Um, but I looked at the landscape of our, of our education reformers, and I saw that our most admirable education reformers were people like Wendy Pop, Arnie Duncan, Diane Ravage, Michelle Wee, even President Barack Obama. And I admire the shit out of all those people. Like, I love these people. Like, they've done incredible work. But not one of them had ever been to a during interstate public school. The people who are driving change at the highest levels have never been through our most struggling public school. So much of our educational reform today is done from a sympathetic perspective, or this outside looking in, where we're saying, let's go and help these poor inner city kids, these poor black and Latino kids, instead of saying, or instead of coming from an empathetic perspective, or from this inside looking out, where you're saying, I understand what you're going through, and I want to help unleash your potential because I've been there right now. And the reality is that most kids who do make it through the system and get these like six-figure job offers when they graduate, take them. Right, like, what ownership or responsibility did I really feel to turn down my Wall Street job offers? Why, why would I have to be the first one to do it? 
So I'm going to take you guys a little bit further back. Um, my senior year, um, I participated in the program called Warring Achievement, and the kick gets to pass advanced placement courses. And at the payout, or the scholar payout, I went into Eddie, who was like the executive director. I got my $2,000 check, and I was like, thank you so much. Um, if there's anything I can do for you, like, please let me know. And he like laughed, obviously, this poor like, inner city kid, like, what is he going to give me, right? Um, and I remember looking up at him, and he said, there's nothing you can do for me, but just pay it forward. I don't know about you all, but um, no one likes to feel like they've been giving, given something for nothing. And I think that was my like, desire when I went out to him. I was like, I want to do something. I want to pay you back. I need this money right now, so I'm not going to give you a check back, obviously. But <laughs> if there's something else I can do to help you out, like, let me know. You don't have time, right? Um, and it's like former successful corporate lawyer was like, there's nothing obviously you can do. Just pay it forward. And I think that itch or desire, like, want to pay it back, um, resonated with me. And so in return for my time today, I want you all to think of two things before you leave here today and that you're going to do to pay it forward. So give it some thought. I'm going to put some of you guys on the spot um, before the end of the lecture. Think of two like small things you can do to pay it forward. Right? Don't even ask the other person to pay it forward. Just do them. It doesn't have to be a person. It could be a thing that you do. But everyone here can take small action that would make a huge difference in someone else's life. Um, it could be as simple as like calling a younger brother or a younger sister or a sibling or a friend and telling them that you believe in them and encouraging them. Um, just pay it forward. So he said that to me. And um, a couple of months ago, I had a mentee actually who was at Cornell who like struggled and kind of like fell off. And I had, I've had a bunch of people ever since my junior year of college asking me, Kareem, like, what was it about you? Like, why did you make it out? And why are so many kids still struggling? Like, how do we support your journey? How do we make sure that more kids come out just like you? And my like blanket statement was always, well, you need to create more opportunities. There aren't enough opportunities. Right? Like the biggest difference between being born in a lower income like neighborhood and a more affluent neighborhood is the number of opportunities that you have. So if we create more opportunities, you have the opportunity to create more careers in the world, and we all know that the world needs more careers, right? No, that's not true. So that was my like blanket answer. And in the process of working with my mentee, I realized that the biggest difference between me and so many of my friends who did make it out was that I was comfortable asking for help. And then I thought about it in a career perspective as well, too. Right? The biggest difference from, between the people who are sort of like successful and really successful are, is the difference between those who ask for help and those who don't ask for help. The difference in some of these lower income neighborhoods, though, um, and the other piece is I think people proportionally ask for help along the entire like, socioeconomic spectrum. So it's not like if you're poor, you're less likely to ask for help than if you're rich, or if you're rich, you're more likely to ask for help than if you're poor, and vice versa. That isn't the case. I think we equally um, ask for help across the entire like, spectrum. The difference, though, is that if you don't ask for help and you're going with a lower like, socioeconomic status or economic like, threshold, um, you wind up as, um, not having a safety net. Right? Whereas if you're a middle class or an affluent household and you don't ask for help, um, odds are there are resources there that someone is going to provide you or someone's going to proactively make sure that you get the help and the support that you need to be able to accomplish what you want. So fundamentally thinking through, okay, well, what are the reasons why people don't ask for help? Well, A, they feel like they're either imposing on someone else's time, they feel like they're owing them something, they feel like they're making themselves look weak, right? They're being too vulnerable. Um, and those are real like reasons. These are real fears. Um, and I think I comforted myself in knowing that I was going to pay it forward, that whatever support I got or whatever mentorship I received or resources I received, I would use that to make a huge impact, right, or a bigger impact. It's such a lot of so many more people. And that allowed me to take advantage of the resources that other people were willing to put out there for me. So comfort yourself in knowing that you need to do that, right? If you want to get ahead and you want to do good and you want to make a bigger impact, then you need to be able to make yourself vulnerable and ask for help when you need it. Like I was 19, 20 when I got, 21 when I graduated, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Right, like, how do you build an organization? How do you scale a company? I get a wake up knowing this stuff. Um, the reality is like you find it by and you surround yourself with people who've already done it. You don't have to recreate the wheel. Yeah, what I was doing in the summer, like learning space was different. But the process of hiring people, firing people, like building team culture, um, raising money, like all of those things have been done several times over. Um, and done by so many other people. 
So I'm not, um, I'm not just going to leave you guys by saying how to problem. I'm also going to say find a mentor. So when I graduated, um, I remember I was having lunch with one of my incoming like Cornell mentees, and I was giving him all of the advice that he could be successful at Cornell. Right? Like I had done a lot of Cornell school, what classes he should take, what professors he should avoid, what professors he should go to, what parties he should stay away from. Um, and I was like sort of giving him all of the answers that he needed to be successful. And then I sat back and I was like, where is my like life mentor? Right, where's the guy who like graduated from college, turned down his offers, or decided that he was going to work with a social venture? Um, can I find that person to give me all of the answers that I need to go do my work? And if not the answers, like guide or steer me in the right direction. Um, and I started asking people for that person. So I would have like conversations with my mentors and my advisors and say, can you help me find this person who's done X, Y, or Z thing? Um, and ultimately, um, Jacob Lee runs the Ubuntu Education Fund. He was super helpful. Um, and it's just been amazing to have someone who's built an organization from the ground up almost 18 years ago now who lost college and sort of did what I did, be like my advisor. Um, it's helped me avoid so many pitfalls, but also has given me a ear um, of someone to just like talk to when I'm struggling or I'm grappling with these issues that like you grapple with in the process of building your own organization. So ask for help and find a mentor. So I'm going to end my like talk, talk there. Um, I will say we are opening up our college application process, so if people are interested in summer internships with our organization, um, it's just practice makes perfect.org forward slash summer. 